This week on the podcast, let's talk about why rhetorical analysis is actually a blast. Sure, it sounds complicated to your students at first. Ethos, pathos, logos, rhetorical situations, logical fallacies, rhetorical techniques. (sighs) But soon enough, all these bits and pieces combine into a really interesting way to see how the songs, conversations, commercials, and speeches in all of our lives are persuading us to change how we view the world. In today's episode, we're talking about creative, engaging ways to get students thinking about these different elements and how they relate to each other. Are you ready to dive in? Hey there, I'm your host, Betsy Potash, and One Pagers, Project-Based Learning, and Choice Reading are my jam. I believe in you, and my goal is to help you explore all the creative possibilities you dream of for your classroom. I'm an educator, a chocolate cake aficionado, a traveler who can't wait to get back to Barcelona, and the kind of mom who brings her own mini makerspace to her kid's classroom when she comes to volunteer. I know this for sure, creativity isn't always easy. As a creative teacher, you get parent calls you treasure, and plenty of sidelong comments you'd rather forget. But here's the bottom line, creative education can ignite a spark in your students and change their lives forever. You and I know this, you're an innovator, and while it's sometimes hard, it's so worth it. So let's explore the world of creative education together. Welcome to the Spark Creativity Teacher Podcast. Okay, so let's begin at the beginning. And for a rhetorical analysis, I think the beginning is the rhetorical situation. It's really nice for students to take a look at the big picture before diving into the gears and levers that make up a rhetorical strategy. There are a lot of bits and pieces, right? But they need to see kind of the the outside appearance of the whole machine before they can really understand the point of the gears and levers. They need to know who is the speaker talking to, what do they want to do with that speech or advertisement or commercial or song, and why do they want to do it? I like to think of a quick example for students around TikTok. What would it be like, I might ask them, if they were giving a speech about the future of TikTok and how it's going to work for businesses and marketers, and they were going to give that speech to, say, a bunch of marketing executives who are in their 60s and don't have TikTok on their phones and just haven't grown up with that culture of TikTok around them. How are they going to convince those people that TikTok is really important and that they need it to market their businesses? Now, what if they're giving the same speech at a YouTube creators conference and they have a bunch of people who are making their living online through video creation? Both speeches are about the future of TikTok for business, but how different would both speeches actually need to be, right? The the evidence may be the same. I mean, TikTok is growing powerfully. Millions of people are watching TikToks, but you have to play it really differently in both situations. So that might be a way that I would just quickly introduce this idea of rhetorical situation, that that the moment, the location, the audience, these things are all super relevant to how to persuade. And then there are a bunch of fun ways um, to work songs into your explanation of rhetorical situations. So let's go through a few. You're going to talk to students about the setup, um, which could mean some movie spoiling, but I've tried to choose some songs that I think most students will have either seen or not really care about by the time they hit secondary. So let's talk about a scene in Frozen. Have you seen the movie? When Anna thinks she's falling in love with Prince Hans, and Hans, of course, is just looking for a quick marriage and a lot of power. If you think about the song, Love is an Open Door, as something other than like a bright little fun poppy hit, and you actually think about Hans' motivation and getting Anna to want to marry him in one day, <laughs> it really changes the whole song, right? So that's something you can, you can play the song, you can talk to students. How does this go from chirpy little song to like weird power grab um, because of the situation? Now let's look at another one. There's a song from Aladdin. Maybe you grew up watching Aladdin like I did, but there's a remake that's that's uh, very popular now with Will Smith. And maybe you can play the song Prince Ali, where Ali is coming in. He's riding on like a huge 
elephant or a camel and he has all this huge parade around him and the genius singing Prince Ali. And he is trying to make the whole city think of Prince Ali as like the most important, most amazing, most wonderful prince in the world. And that's all you would get from the song if you didn't know the situation, right? But if you know the situation, you know that the genie has to do that because he's bound by this wish. You know that Ali is actually motivated um, by something very different. He's coming into the city. He's going to try to win the princess over. Um, and he's he's masquerading as somebody that he's actually not. And so the song feels really different <laughs> when you know all those things, when you know the motivation, um, when you understand the context. Okay, one more from Disney. This, this is a particular favorite of mine. Maybe it's just because I love Moana. But in Moana, near the beginning of the movie, Moana wants to go out to sea, right? She she has this um, inner impulse to go and explore and to go out on boats. And she's always trying to do it as a toddler, as a young girl, as an older girl. And her dad just wants to get her to stop. And so he sings her this song, Where You Are, that's all about her wonderful island and how beautiful everything is and how, how perfect it is for her to become the leader and how much she's going to love it. Meanwhile, the actual situation is that she is like longingly staring at the beach and the and the boats there and wishing that that that's what she could do. And so it's it's very much about, oh, this island is beautiful, but the underlying context is don't leave, please don't leave. And and knowing that just really changes the way you hear this song. Okay, so those are some fun Disney examples. I bet you're already thinking of five or six more in your head. There's so many more. Um, there are also a lot of great songs from, you know, older kid movies, maybe more mature movies. If you feel like your students can handle it, maybe if they can handle seeing a character say one swear word or see a character have a drink at a bar, then you could then you could look at songs like My Shot from Hamilton or The Other Side from The Greatest Showman. And those also would provide really interesting conversations around rhetorical strategy and rhetorical situation. Okay, so leaving rhetorical situation behind for a second, let's talk about ethos, pathos, and logos and a fun way to just give students some quick practice with it, okay? So you introduce the concepts. Ethos shows the credibility, the character of the speaker. Pathos plays on the emotions of the listeners. Logos uses logic and reason to make a case. These are these are fun things to play around with. You can pick apart speeches, of course. You can look for examples of these. But let's just talk about a quick way to get students using ethos, pathos, and logos in like a 15-minute class activity. And this is just going to be an elevator pitch. An elevator pitch is a big thing in the business world. Having sort of a prepared pitch ready that's like 60 seconds or 90 seconds, if you get the ear of a powerful business person or investor that you're going to try to get um, to believe in your idea or to try to get to believe in you and hire you, a an elevator pitch is something many people practice honing um, and, and preparing to deliver. So you're, you're introducing this concept. You're not going to go into all the details of the elevator pitch. You're not going to try to help students write the perfect elevator pitch. Um, but you are going to say, look, this, this is a real thing that people often do. They try to come up with an argument. They try to deliver it really quickly to somebody powerful. Imagine you're doing the same kind of in this high school or middle school context. So for example, maybe you have 60 seconds and you're riding the elevator downtown. You happen to be at the mall and the president of the school board gets in the elevator with you. You say to your students and you have a new class. You just really wish that the district would offer so you could take it. Whatever it is, your dream class. How can you in the next 60 seconds as you ride this elevator down from the top floor of the mall to the bottom floor of the mall with the school board president, how can you convince them to host your class in this district? And then tell them they need to use ethos, pathos, and logos. You can give them sort of a graphic organizer that just shows three bars. Maybe they start with ethos, move into pathos, and wrap up with logos. Or maybe they're taking their elevator pitch and they're trying to convince their parents to let them go on a three-week school ski trip. 
And their parents are probably going to have a million reasons why three weeks is way too long to miss school. It's way too long to be away from home. It's way they're going to miss this. They're going to miss that. But they need to try to convince them using ethos, pathos, and logos in 60 seconds. What powerful arguments can they use to get themselves onto this fun three-week trip with their friends? Or maybe, and this is my favorite example that I thought of, maybe they've just met the owner of their absolute favorite candy store and they have this idea. They want the candy store owner to make them a brand ambassador for the candy store and send them to school every week with bags of candy from the store so that they can just be eating it really publicly around their friends and sharing it with other kids and then pretty soon everyone will be like, man, I love that candy, I wanna go to that store. And the student will get to have free candy every week for all of school. Um, And the store will benefit because all these more children will come and buy candy at the store. So they have 60 seconds. They need to make a pitch using ethos, pathos, and logos to turn them into a candy brand ambassador. In my opinion, the more fun, the more the more really relevant to your students and what they like, you can make the prompt, then the more fun it's going to be to practice the skill of writing with ethos, pathos, and logos. And there's no reason it needs to be something super formal. You want them to really get comfortable with this idea of using their credibility and character, playing on emotion, and using logic and reason to make a case. And you can use those skills for anything, right? It, it can be about whatever is going to make it fun for them to write. Okay, so we talked about introducing situation and then introducing ethos and pathos and logos. Let's talk quickly about combining the two. Now, I mentioned this last time in our podcast episode about celebrating Black History Month and celebrating Black artists and activists and authors all year round. Um, but I'm going to bring it up again because it's perfect for this one too. You can try this activity, the Super Bowl performance one pager. And I have already um, put all of this curriculum as a free download in the show notes, just like I did last time. What it does is it takes the two things we just introduced, situation and the different appeals, and it combines them. It has students watch or read an article or a a podcast um, about some situations. There's there's two performances students can pick or you can do both activities. In one, they learn about the context of Whitney Houston's Super Bowl performance in 1991. And in another, they learn about the context of Amanda Gorman's poetry performance at a more recent Super Bowl. They learn the context and then they watch the video of the performance. And I've got to tell you that the difference when you understand the context before you see the video is just everything. It really brings home how powerful situation is. And then with that in mind, you start to look at the appeals and how they are really an extension of the of the performer's understanding of the situation. And so I like this as a next step. Once students understand the concept of situation, maybe through some fun songs, some fun examples, Once they understand the the varied appeals, then you can put the two together with this activity um, and really help them see how it all comes together. Okay, another idea, and this sort of just complements everything we've talked about so far, is to use your environment to help teach these concepts. And this is something I've really been thinking about a lot lately for like all content in English language arts or really in any subject, I have always been so fascinated by the Reggio Emilia system of early childhood learning that was developed in Italy. And if you have never heard of it and you don't know what I'm talking about, I really encourage you to do a little bit of Googling about Reggio Emilia because it's it's amazing. The learning spaces that are created, the, the learning documentation, the ownership that children have over their learning, It just blows my mind. I was like so tempted to move to the countryside of Italy when my children were toddlers so that they could go to a Reggio Emilia school. But anyway, that's a bit of a tangent. In the Reggio Emilia system, the environment, the classroom environment is referred to as the third teacher. And I love this so much to have an environment that's so rich, that's so um, just full of complementary materials that help students think in new ways about what they're learning. I just love that idea. And I think that, you know, I've probably talked about this before, but I think that in the secondary world, it's, it's widely less 
less of a focus than in the primary world to really consider how the environment can help influence learning. And if if we can really learn from the primary world, it will benefit the kids so much. If I think about flexible seating and well-stocked classroom libraries and pleasant lighting plants, beautiful bulletin boards, this is something I think that people of all ages will thrive with, right? Not just younger kids. Um, so if you're if you're thinking about how to bring the concepts of rhetorical analysis into the environment, I think you can easily create some really cool displays that relate to these concepts. You can make posters for pathos, ethos, and logos. You can have students create posters, maybe in groups or partnerships. This could be a fun way if you've been waiting for your opportunity to introduce them to Canva and teach some Canva skills, or if you'd like to teach them some layering skills on Google Slides, this is a fun chance for them to flex their multimodal composition skills, their their design skills to help them bring across a concept. So I've put some examples of posters for ethos and pathos in the show notes if you want to see a little bit. But I think you can really surround them um, with learning <laughs> by by having by having some displays that relate to these things. And there are a lot of different ways that you could create an assignment around creating visuals for this. Um, the examples on the on the show notes are just one very limited <laughs> example. But however you think it would be fun to create um, kind of an installation around ethos, pathos, and logos in your classroom, I think that would be really great. Okay. We've covered a lot. The last thing I want to talk about is the idea of using game-based learning at the end of a rhetorical analysis unit to help students kind of review it all and remember it all. So I recently did a blog post, which I'm going to link in the show notes, that kind of walks you through creating a board game around any big ELA concept. And the one that I used as my example was a rhetorical analysis board game. So you can check it out and see how I created a game around these concepts. It's kind of like shoots and ladders. Kids roll, they move their pieces around the board, they can land on squares that say ethos, pathos, logos, rhetorical situation, fallacy, um, or they can land on these kind of problem ones that are like the um, the shoots and shoots and ladders. Like it, it will say, yikes, your argument hit a slippery slope. You claimed a whole series of events would follow from the first one you mentioned, but where's your evidence? Slide back to the beginning. Um, and so they just, they kind of go through, they answer questions about the different concepts unless they hit a logical fallacy, slippery slope or bandwagon fallacy that sends them back five squares or whatever. And it's just like a fun way um, to help them go over all the different things from the unit. But there are a lot of different games that you could use. You could cahoot it up if you haven't cahooted lately. You could try. I I recently stumbled upon Jennifer Gonzalez's fun game called Crumple and Shoot. And I'm going to link you to a quick video in the show notes. This is a fun game where you have kids in groups um, and they, they have to write down their answer to a question that you read. And if they get it right, then somebody in the group, like somebody from every group could, could do this. If they all got it right, that's fine. They take the correct answer. They crumple it up on their little piece of paper that they wrote the answer on. And they get to try to shoot it into a basket in your room. And if they do shoot it correctly, their team gets a point. <laughs> so the group collaborates to come up with the answer. Then they choose a shooter who brings the ball up, the ball of paper, shoots it into the basket, um, and tries to get a point. Anyway, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to link you to the video if that was too fast of a description. But I think that could be really fun for a rhetorical analysis. You just put down some questions get kids into a group. Another one that could be fun would be like an old school Jeopardy board on your smart board or whiteboard where kids can just say like, you know, I'll take logical fallacies for 500 or I'll take rhetorical situation for 200 and you just kind of give the two teams points or the three teams points based on whether they get the questions right on the Jeopardy board. I, I was just thinking about how much I used to like playing Jeopardy at school the other day and I haven't thought about it in so long I've, I I think of it as just something automatic that everyone's already doing but then I realize I haven't done it in a really long time and just because I enjoyed it in school maybe it's kind of fallen out so anyway that would that would still be in my opinion a very fun thing to do um, and it would work well with rhetorical analysis okay 
We've covered a lot. I hope you found a new strategy that complements the wonderful ways I'm sure you're already teaching rhetorical analysis. There are so many possibilities. I'm going to leave you today with a final challenge. I've never done this before, but my friend Angela Stockman shared the most interesting video with me last year. I'm just really intrigued by it, and I think it has lots of possible classroom uses. It's called, This is a Generic Brand Video. And I'm not going to say anything more about it. I think that you should go into the show notes and watch it. It's like two or three minutes. And I feel like it's a fantastic springboard for some kind of project or activity for rhetorical analysis and how persuasion is also influenced by multimedia, by like the songs playing, by the by the images in front of you while you're listening to words. But I, I just can't quite decide how I would want to use it. I can't put my finger on exactly a project or an activity around this is a generic brand video. So my challenge for you today is to go into the show notes, watch this is a generic brand video, and then in the comments, share an idea. How could we use this to teach rhetorical analysis? Because it's just so intriguing, but I can't decide. Thank you so much for joining me today. To find all the links and images and the challenge from this week's episode, just head to the show notes at nowsparkcreativity.com. Until next time, take care of yourself and stay creative. <music>